Welcome to the online service of Springton Lake Presbyterian Church. My name is David White. I am the associate pastor. We want to give a special welcome to any who are joining us online for the first time. We're so glad that you found our service. If you live in Delaware County, we hope at some point that we can meet you soon. And that some point could actually be next Sunday. On July 12th, we are going to gather at 10 a.m. on our back lawn out here to, to celebrate together the first time since March, gathering, worshiping, partaking of the Lord's Supper together. If you feel ready, we, we encourage you to plan to join us. Uh, if you are not ready, that's okay. Take your time. We know many of you are at risk with either you're older and you're in that category or you have underlying health medical conditions, but, but we invite any who are ready to come and worship. We are going to begin next week at 9.45 with a musical prelude, and we really want to encourage people to arrive early. It's going to take some time. All the seating is going to be done by ushers so that everyone's appropriately socially distant from one another. So it's going to take a little bit of time to orchestrate that. So please plan to come early, enjoy the musical prelude, find a seat, uh, and, and we'll be starting the service then at 10 o'clock. We want to encourage you to wear comfortable clothes and, and good shoes to be able to navigate the, the hill out back. Um, but it is going to be a wonderful time of celebration together. We are so eager to regather and to worship together again. Let me open our time in prayer. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us over these last four months. We thank you for being a shield about us. We thank you for how you have answered the prayer that no one from SLPC has succumbed to this virus. And we pray that as we regather again, that you would continue to protect us. We pray that no one would get sick as a result of joining together. Uh, and so, Lord, we, we want to uh, anticipate that even as we gather now online again to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. And I should have mentioned, we have uh, full details on, on expectations for our service and what the procedures will look like on our website. So please take a look at those before you come. This weekend, of course, we are celebrating Independence Day. It is the most significant national holiday that we have. And I praise God for the freedoms that we have as Americans I'm particularly grateful for the First Amendment that protects our freedom of religion, that forbids the, the forming of a state religion, and, and permits the, the free exercise of our faith. You know, I have dear friends serving Christ in China, and I've seen firsthand what it's like to live under an oppressive regime, wearing face coverings to avoid facial recognition technology and slipping in and out of side doors and alleys to avoid police. Uh, we are blessed to have the freedoms that we enjoy. And I pray that you will take time over this weekend to reflect on that, to thank God for it. Uh, I'm particularly grateful for the service men and women who have dedicated their lives to securing these freedoms, protecting these freedoms, and, and safeguarding them for future generations. So thank you, if that is you. One of the challenges that faces us today, given this national history, is holding together the freedom we prize with our calling as Christians. And there's an irony here, because our most significant national holiday that we just celebrated reflects back on the time when we threw down the gauntlet and cast off the fetters of the crown of England to declare our freedom and our independence from England. And yet our calling as Christians is to submit ourselves to the righteous king. You know, humanity was created, according to scripture, humanity was created to live as a servant. And that's why the apostle Paul, one of his favorite self-descriptions, is a bond servant of Christ. So as we celebrate our freedoms this weekend, as we celebrate Independence Day, remember what we're taught in Galatians 5. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
So true freedom, according to scripture, is loving and serving others. Now the question is, how do we get there? The answer is, we get there by submitting to the true king, to the righteous king, who calls us to live as his servants, but promises that when we do, when we lose our life for his sake, we find that which is truly life. Please stand wherever you are and join me now in our call to worship to the true king. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. Let's worship our great God together. Please sing with us. will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thoughts of rocks and trees, of skies and This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I hear him. 
to me everywhere It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you only Great are you This is my Father's world Oh, let me never forget That though the wrong seems oh so strong God is the ruler, yes This is my Father's world The battle is not done Jesus who died shall be satisfied It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Amen. This is a new song that we are introducing to you today. Come to us, O Lord. O living word, please come and dwell in us. Lord, wipe away these tears O oh, ancient sun so long foretold we're desperate souls draw near and we will stand Securely in the strength of the Lord Every heart will surely come and adore The Great I Am Our Shepherd King Please come and dwell in of grace lead on oh. and we will stand securely in the strength of the Lord every heart will surely come and adore the great I am we need you now Break our chains by your glory and power. Make us captive to the holy desire. Come to us, O oh Lord. Come to us, O oh Lord. Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, 
chosen one. Oh, we need you now. To thee we run, and we will stand securely in the strength of the Lord. Every heart will surely come and adore the great I am. We need you now. Make a choice for glory and power. Make us captive to the holy desire. Come to us, so Over the course of 2020, we have been using Scripture as the foundation for our pastoral prayers. So I'm going to be praying out of Ephesians 1. Uh, please follow along as I read Ephesians 1, starting in verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe." according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and a dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. Please pray with me. Father, we praise you for the saints of SLPC. We praise you for your grace in carrying us through this pandemic over these last four months. Lord, you know the longing in our hearts to be together again. And so we thank you for for bringing us to the point where we can do that next week, and we pray that you would go before us in our regathering. We pray that you would protect us. We pray for good weather. Lord, we want to ask that you would bless us with cool, dry Sundays for weeks going forward. We pray even for overcast days, Lord, that we would be uh, spared the heat of the sun. We know that these are, not, these are small things for you. And so you tell us we, we have not because we ask not. And so we're asking that you would bless our regathering and our desire to do that in a way that is safe and wise. Lord, your word tells us to ask for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and that we would grow in our knowledge of you. Lord, we, we want more of you. We want to know who you are. We want to know what you have done for us. We want to live more and more out of that relationship, knowing that, that when we know you as the true king, that when we submit to you as your servants, that that is where we find life, that that's where we find the power to, to bless and love well and serve others. Lord, we so desperately in this season need to know the hope to which you've called us, we confess, God, that we are prone to hope in lesser things. We are prone to hope in the things of this world. Uh, we've seen how those things have been shaken over the last four months. Lord, we, we want to have the ultimate hope that you've promised, uh, a restored cosmos in which all things are made right. 
We want a certainty of where you are taking us to. And at the same time, as we are hoping in that great end, we are praying that your kingdom would come. And to that end, Lord, we pray that you would remove this this plague from our planet. We pray that you would uh, stretch out your hand, that you would obliterate COVID-19. We pray that you would remove this plague from us, that health would be restored. And God, in the meantime, we are asking for wisdom and for grace to navigate this in a way that honors you and shows love to one another. Father, would you fix our eyes on the glorious inheritance that's coming? Uh, You taught us, Lord Jesus, that we should not store up treasures uh, that moths can eat and rust can corrode and thieves can steal, but we should store up treasures in heaven. Would you, Lord, give us grace to live beyond the stuff of this earth? and to invest our lives in the inheritance that's coming. Lord, would you help us to live for that great day and that that would be practical in moment-by-moment ways in our lives in this world. Lord, would you give us grace to believe in the greatness of your power at work? This passage describes it as the power that raised Jesus from the dead, that there is resurrection power available to us. And would you help us to see that, God, in whatever seems insurmountable to us today? That could be personal relationships that are broken, marriages, parent-child relationships, extended family relationships, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. Lord, it could be personal struggles with sin. Would you help us to see the power that is available to us that raised Jesus from the dead? And as we saw in the passage last week, we cry out with the Father, we believe, help our unbelief. Would you increase our faith? And Father, we know that there are many right now who are suffering as a result of this pandemic. There are those among us who are bereaved of loved ones. There are those who are suffering the effects of of an economy that has Uh, been ground to a halt and now is trying to restart. Lord, we pray particularly for the the unemployed and underemployed of SLPC that you would provide. Lord, we thank you for, for your promise to do just that. And so we are claiming that and asking, Lord, that you would move on the behalf of our brothers and sisters. Lord, the This passage says that that Jesus is above all things, that he is reigning over the universe, that he's been given as the head over all to the church. So we thank you, Jesus, that you are reigning, even though, as Hebrews says, we don't yet see it. And we thank you that you've called us to be your body. Would you help us to be your hands and feet in the communities where you've placed us? Will you help us to trust as we see so many things being eroded culturally, so many ways that, that uh, aspects of Christianity are under attack? Would you help us to trust that you are reigning and that the day is coming when every tongue will confess and every knee will bow? Would you help us to have confidence believing that promise and being your herald now, knowing that that is guaranteed? Uh, And would you give us wisdom as your body? And we thank you for this this great declaration that, Lord Jesus, you are the one who fills all in all. Would you give us in our relationship with you as we abide in you, increasing contentment and joy, especially at such a difficult time as this. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers and answer them. And we finally want to ask that you would go before Rick, that you would give him your words to speak, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts that would be soft. Lord, would you be at work through the preaching of your word? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Springton Lake, and thank you, Dave, for leading us in prayer such a vital part of what we've been able to do, even though online together, go before the throne of grace. Pray with me, if you would, Psalm 1914. The words of David the psalmist to God Most High. Pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. 
I too look forward to our outdoor service next Sunday. I will speak from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, where Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll be preaching to myself. I really need that rest from Christ. I'm beginning to feel it just like you more and more every day, longing for that connection, longing for that healing, longing for stability, longing for hope, hope that we find in Jesus Christ. Now today is our last Sunday in our study in the Gospel of Mark until after Labor Day. Dave will be bringing a series of messages from Paul's letter to Titus, a wonderful book in the New Testament, a letter. And uh, then I'll be speaking in August, later the Lord willing, on lessons learned from the pandemic. And then sometime in September, probably, like I said, right after Labor Day, we'll return to the Gospel of Mark. So turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 9. In this passage that we've been looking at for many weeks, Jesus comes down from the mountain of glory into the valley of despair. The contrast for Jesus is unimaginable. The first part of Mark chapter 9 describes what happened to Jesus at Mount Hermon, where he stood in the glorious presence of his heavenly Father. Look at verse 2 and 3. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Away from the crowds, in the cool, clean air of the mountain, Peter, James, and John had a life-changing experience that they would never forget. For a brief moment... They were allowed to see the life Jesus had always known. For endless ages, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have reigned in perfect harmony as the sovereign God of the universe outside of space and time. But now these three simple fishermen, far away from home, are gifted with a glimpse of the majesty and the splendor that Jesus has left behind. They see him with their own eyes, not in a dream, not in a vision. They see him glorified and enveloped in the holy light of his Father. Look at verse 7 and 8. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. We need Jesus today. We need to listen to Jesus today and every day, more than ever. It raises the question, though, why did Jesus leave his royal throne? On the mountain, he's clothed in the light and life of God, but on the cross, he's stricken, smitten, afflicted, and pierced in the dark. On the mountain, he enjoys fellowship with his Father, but on the cross, he is utterly alone, forsaken, and curse for sin. Why did Jesus suffer like this? Years later, Peter, James, and John answered this question in letters to the early church. Peter put it this way. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to God. James wrote this. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? And John declared this great verse. We all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Why did Jesus do this? He did this to give us true freedom. But there was another reason Jesus went up onto the mountain. He went there for a meeting with his father. He went for inspiration and for courage and for strength to fulfill the mission that was put before him. He told his disciples plainly about it, but they did not understand. 
Mark chapter 8, verse 31, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. But now, after an experience they will never forget, Jesus leads this trio down, down, down into the sweltering valley below. It's a descent into disagreement, desperation, destruction, disappointment, and deliverance. First, there's disagreement. The religious leaders and the disciples are arguing and doing nothing over the identity and the ministry of Jesus. There's also desperation in the valley below. Great crowds of people with physical, emotional, financial, and spiritual needs have gathered all in the hope of seeing Jesus. But one man, a father with his son, is featured in the story. Being attacked by demonic destruction, the father describes his son's condition. He says he has a spirit that makes him mute, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And then it's a descent into disappointment. The father who calls Jesus teacher tells him, teacher, I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And Jesus then laments, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you. And then note, take note, look at it carefully in, in the passage. Take note that the healing begins with the command, bring him to me. Bring him to me, Jesus said. I believe that we make a grave error when this is not our first response. We are so self-sufficient. I am so self-sufficient. Who do I call? What phone number do I dial first? Who do I email? Who do I text? Who else is reliable? Who else can we trust to lead us and to give us wisdom? Who else commands even the unseen wicked spirits? Jesus said, bring him to me for deliverance. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has this been happening to him? And the answer should break our hearts when the father says, from childhood, his entire life, welcome to planet Earth. Paul told Timothy in his second letter that from the cradle to the grave, the human race has been, and I quote, in the snare of the devil captured to do his will. The disciples tried to cast out this demonic spirit. On the road with Jesus, they beheld satanic oppression many times. In fact, Jesus gave them authority over this wickedness. Mark making it very clear in 3, 14, and 15 when he wrote this, and Jesus appointed 12 so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So why were they powerless? Or to make it more personal, why are we powerless? Later, away from the crowd, the disciples asked Jesus directly, Lord, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus replied in such simplicity, because you did not pray. This short statement is full of meaning. Pastor Dave emphasized it last week, and it is so important and must be repeated. Because you did not pray. We will always fail if we don't pray. John Wesley, along with fellow evangelists George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, preached to the American colonists from 720 to 1740. Together, as the word was preached, they saw a turning to Christ that was later described as the great awakening, a great turning, a great uncovering of biblical truth. The light was finally visible in their hearts, closed because of sin. Wesley described the power behind it when he wrote that God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. This is a powerful story in Mark's gospel, in chapter 9. 
In response to this moment, Dr. Tim Keller in his book, Jesus the King, which is a narrative or a commentary on Mark's gospel, he wrote this. How arrogant. How clueless they are about their inadequacy to deal with the evil and suffering of the world. The disciples tried prayerless exorcism for the same reason that they couldn't understand why Jesus had to die. They didn't see how weak and proud they were. They underestimated the power of evil in the world and in themselves. I fear we are making the same mistake today. The only person in this story who admits his weakness is the boy's father. He has spent his entire life and probably all of his life savings trying to find a cure for his son going from one end of Israel to the other. So it's not surprising that in the face of another evil attack on his son and the inability of Jesus' disciples to help them, that his faith would be weak. We hear it in his cry. I believe. Help my unbelief. This is probably one of the most honest statements in the New Testament. To quote Keller again, this is very good news. Because through Jesus we don't need perfect righteousness, just repentant helplessness to access the presence of God. Every follower of Christ in their time of need, should run to Jesus, crying out to him with humble and broken hearts, I'm not in control, I am not strong, I am overwhelmed by fear and by doubt. Help, help! With that humility comes a spiritual power that destroys the work of the devil. This is how John put it. He wrote, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. Look at verse 25. Jesus says, you mutant deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. But because this wicked attack was so fierce, as David pointed out last week, the boy seemed dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. Now, Jesus is ready to begin the slow but steady descent toward Jerusalem. It's the road to true freedom, a freedom so costly that its payment is the life of God. Look at verse 30 and 32. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. Jesus now leaves the north shore of the Sea of Galilee in our story, a region of relative safety, and he turns south toward Jerusalem, a place, ironically, of great danger. But he does not go on this journey alone. But he does seek to be alone with his disciples. And here's the reason why. He knows that his message and his ministry is so radical that if he doesn't write it first on their hearts, he will fail. Only Jesus knows the full extent of what must be overcome. And the Bible uses careful language, but it is no respecter of persons, and it is not politically correct. The Apostle Paul, years later, brought it into clarity. Paul wrote that everyone then, now, and will be until Jesus returns. Everyone is a slave to sin, controlled by the devil, the prince of this world. The devil still lays claim to every life addicted to sin under the penalty of death, no matter the color, the culture, or the class. 
sorrow for our slavery only comes with the mercy of repentance. When God mercifully turns our head, moves us in a new direction, opens our eyes. And we will never know this joy until we repent of our pride, turn into the only one who deserves our worship. But notice the first challenge that Jesus faces on this road to freedom. Look at Mark 9, 33. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Just how clueless the disciples are is made very clear in this story. They are not five miles down the road. Five miles when an argument breaks out among the twelve. Now Jesus, who is God, knows their thoughts. He heard them, he heard their hearts, and he calls them out. He says, hey guys, what were you discussing on the way? And Mark writes, but they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Their silence proves their guilt. My guess is this. Peter, James, and John are walking together. They are the mountaintop clique. Sorry, guys, they told the other nine, but we can't tell you what happened up there. Jesus made his promise. Can't you just hear it? But what Jesus heard in their talk was pride, which always gives birth to a great desire for power. Dr. Damon Linker is a professor at Ursinus College. On Friday in thisweek.com, he wrote this in answer to the question, what is the source of our failure in America? Dr. Linker lives right in this area. He's taught critical writing at Penn. He's an author of numerous books on the subject of the spiritual life of America. He's a follower of Christ. And this is what he wrote in answer. What is the source of the failure in America? It has many names. Individualism, cultural libertarianism, selfishness, suspicion of authority, and it takes a multitude of forms. But whatever we call it, it amounts to a refusal on the part of lots of Americans to think in terms of the social whole, of what is best for the community. Each of us thinks we know what's best for ourselves. And we resent being told what to do. Instead, we say, who are you to tell me what to do? A desire for position and power is already tempting Jesus' disciples. If allowed to fester, this attitude will lead them down the road of destruction. That's why Jesus confronts this head on. Boys, listen to me on this subject of the Messiah. My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. This is not about power. This is not about prosperity. This is about humility and service in my kingdom. Now, verse 35, it's easy to miss this. Mark tells us that Jesus sat down. 
This is the body language of authority. A rabbi, a leader of high standing, would most often sit down. And the language of the body would draw people even in closer, hanging on every word. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. To illustrate the point, Jesus brings a child into the middle of this debate. Obviously, mothers and fathers' families are present, not just the 12. And Jesus hugs him. Mark says, taking him in his arms. No social distancing. But understand this. We need to know this. Children had no position or standing in the first century. None. A child can't advance your career. They can't enhance your position in society. They can't buy you anything. It's all the other way around. They need help in every area of their lives or they literally will die. And with a child in his arms, he says in verse 37, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me Dirty with dirt from head to foot. No place to wash their hands. No liquid soap. No change of clothes. No nursery. No playground. Whoever welcomes one of these little ones welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. I believe this is Jesus saying, don't favor the influential and the great to the neglect of the simple and the humble and the ordinary. Listen to this convicting quote from Dr. N.T. Wright, a former Anglican bishop an author who wrote about this story, and I quote, this lesson resonates out into the centuries of church history in which so many have thought that being close to Jesus in full service to him made them somehow special. But those who have really understood his message know that things aren't like that. As Jesus goes to the cross, turning upside down everything his disciple had imagined, he is also turning upside down the way people, including Christians, still think today. If we feel sorry for the disciples and their confusion, Dr. Wright wrote, we should ask ourselves just how confused we ourselves still are. Look at verse 35. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all. And servant of all. And then Jesus says, let's get going. We must continue our journey on the road to true freedom. Our closing song is to thee we run. When these days of shadow pass and suffering is no more, a fire in the dark will glow and Christ our souls restore. O oh, light, heaven shine down on earth. O oh, joy, come and break the curse. We praise the name above every name. A light has come in Christ. To thee we run. Worship team, come. And lead us in this song as a prayer of thanksgiving and anticipation.
When these days of shadow pass And suffering is no more A fire in the dark will glow And Christ our souls restore Holy child of mystery, please set a place our hearts with grace unending, love so pure and peace the ancient dark. shine down on earth oh joy come and break the curse we praise the name above every name a light has come and Christ to thee we washed beneath the sea a living stream shall quench our thirst for all eternity a light heaven shine down on earth oh Come and break the curse we praise the name above every name a light has come and Christ to thee we rise Amen We praise the name above every name. A light has come, and Christ, to thee we run. After the benediction, let me encourage you, as we do each week, to take a few moments wherever you are to pray for a national turning to Christ. He is our only hope for healing and restoration. It is finished. Run to Jesus. Pray for a cure to COVID-19. And pray Psalm 25, 6. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and your love. Now go into a new week with this benediction, Revelation 1, 5, and 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to God and the Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.